When de-icing your car, it's common practice to turn the engine on and to turn any of the demissers on. That way, any heat that's available is going to make the process easier. So engine on, front demister on, rear demister on, and even the wing mirror demisters on. Not that the wing mirrors are frozen at the moment. Now that heat being generated should make this easier. But there is a significant problem with doing it this way. The exhaust pipe on your car isn't just a metal pipe. It's far more clever and more expensive than that. A section of the exhaust pipe is called the catalytic converter. Most people just call it a cat. If someone says they've replaced the cat on their car, they're not referring to something with whiskers, they are referring to a section of their exhaust. In this video, I'm going to call it a cat because if I say catalytic converter too many times, I start to mince my words. What the cat does is it reduces harmful gases from the engine to far less harmful gases. And we're not talking about reducing them by five, 10, 20% or even 50%. We're talking about reducing them down to a tiny fraction of what they were before. The problem with the cat is it doesn't work until it's warm. Usually it needs to be at least 250 degrees Celsius before it starts to work. If you turn your engine on and start driving, typically it's gonna get warm enough to start working within about 30 seconds. But if you turn your engine on and just leave it running without driving it, well, it can take minutes for it to heat up. And although it's important to avoid breathing in exhaust fumes whenever possible, when the cat isn't working, it's even more important because the quantity of harmful gases you will be breathing in is many times greater than it would be if the cat was up to temperature and was working. So what are these harmful gases then? Well, they are nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide. A catalytic converter converts these gases into water vapor, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. Yes, catalytic converters increase carbon dioxide emissions, but the amount they reduce the far more harmful gases by is considered well worth the slight increase in carbon dioxide emissions. I'm now gonna give a quick overview of how these harmful gases can be harmful to humans. I'm gonna start off with nitrogen oxides. Notice I'm using a plural there, oxides, I'm not saying oxide. And that's because nitrogen oxides, which is known as NOx, N-O-X, has various nitrogen oxides in it. The main ones being nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. The reason why they are grouped is because nitrogen monoxide can become nitrogen dioxide and vice versa. Nitrogen dioxide can become nitrogen monoxide. These reactions happen quick and can happen often. So the two gases can switch between each other. So that's why they're grouped together as NOx, N-O-X, nitrogen oxides. You want to avoid breathing these in. Short-term exposure uh, can cause inflamed airways. It can increase your susceptibility to respiratory infections and allergens, and it can exasperate existing heart and lung conditions. Also, nitrogen oxides create ground level ozone, which is harmful to human health. It can cause a wide variety of different inflammations, and it can cause asthma attacks. It's important not to get mixed up between nitrogen oxides, which I've just mentioned, NOx, and nitrous oxide. They are quite different. As I've just said, nitrogen oxides create ground level ozone, also known as smog, which is harmful to human health. Whereas nitrous oxide, something different, that actually depletes the ozone layer way up there in the stratosphere. The ozone layer that we need to protect us from radiation. Since 1990, the population of the UK has increased and the number of vehicles using its roads has increased also. But the amount of nitrogen oxide, which is emitted each year, has decreased dramatically. In 1990, the UK emitted 2.8 million tonnes of nitrogen oxides. But in 2023, it was 0.6 million tons of nitrogen oxides. That's a dramatic decrease. 
Not all of it is down to the catalytic converter though, because not all nitrogen oxides are caused by road transport, but the catalytic converter has played a major role in this reduction of nitrogen oxide emissions. Do you like the smell of petrol? Well, if you do, what you can smell are hydrocarbons and you don't want to be breathing that stuff in. The World Health Organization classify some hydrocarbons as group one carcinogens, meaning there is sufficient evidence that they cause cancer. Also, hydrocarbons can cause respiratory problems, nervous system problems, organ damage, and a whole long list of other health problems. And also when you cold start your engine, there are actually two reasons why there is an increased level of hydrocarbons out the exhaust. The first being the catalytic converter not being up to temperature as explained before, but also to cold start a petrol or diesel engine, you actually need a higher fuel mixture, more fuel compared to air than normal and not all that fuel gets burnt. Some comes out of the exhaust as a hydrocarbon. So when you cold start your engine, you don't want to hang around it breathing in that carcinogenic gas. You want to get going and get the system up to temperature and working as quickly as possible. Many engines these days are fitted with particulate filters. This is not instead of a catalytic converter, this is in addition to a catalytic converter, so you will have both. What particulate filters do is they filter out tiny little particles that you don't want to breathe in but they also reduce hydrocarbons because hydrocarbons can stick to some of these particles and then that particle acts as a carrier to get it into your body. So the filter filtering out the particle stops the particle going into your body, but also the hydrocarbon. Particulate filters generally start working as soon as you start the engine, but they can't clean themselves, a process known as regeneration, unless they are hot. So if you do lots of short journeys and don't allow the particulate filter to be hot enough for long enough, it will gradually clog up over time and eventually your engine will stop working. Particulate filters fitted to petrol engines are far less likely to get clogged up. It's diesel particulate filters when the driver is doing lots of short journeys that usually have the problem. If you do lots of short journeys, a diesel probably isn't for you. It's probably just gonna cost you money and be hassle. If you do short journeys, you're most likely gonna be better off with some kind of petrol, hybrid, or electric vehicle. Carbon monoxide, not to be confused with carbon dioxide, is very harmful to human health. Many of us are aware of this, and I know this because many people have carbon monoxide detectors and alarms in their property. Because if there is a carbon monoxide leak and you are asleep, you may not wake up. So this alarm acts like a smoke alarm, but for carbon monoxide to wake you up. So you do wake up instead of getting carbon monoxide poisoning and then dying in your sleep. High doses of carbon monoxide can lead to death, can lead to brain damage, can lead to many other different health issues. But what I didn't know before researching for this video is that a low dose of carbon monoxide, but over a prolonged period of time is also harmful to human health. It can lead to nausea, headaches, it can lead to neuropsychological problems, cardiovascular issues, it can give you flu-like symptoms. So if you can, avoid breathing in any amount of carbon monoxide that is possible to avoid. The examples of health issues that I'm giving in this video are not the only health issues you can get from breathing in these gases. They are just the ones that stand out to me. It would be impractical for me to list all the health issues and explain them in this video. I think that would be quite boring to watch as well. Also, I don't know all the health issues, but it seems pretty clear that you don't want to breathe these gases in. Earlier, I said that catalytic converters increase carbon dioxide emissions, and that's true, they do. But the increase in carbon dioxide is well worth the decrease in those other gases, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide. Now, if we were solely focused on carbon dioxide, we could actually create vehicles that generate far less carbon dioxide and go far further per gallon of fuel or per litre of fuel. Approximately 30% of the energy in fuel is wasted out of the exhaust as heat in a petrol or diesel car, approximately 30%. It's not exactly that, and it does vary from car to car. Now, if we didn't care about emissions that are harmful to human health, like hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides, well, we could use that heat 
and convert it into kinetic energy, especially in a hybrid. After all, electricity in power stations is generated from heat. So we could capture that heat, convert it into electrical energy, and then use it to power our vehicles, and therefore we would get many more miles per gallon and produce less CO2. But the quality of the air that we would be breathing in would be far worse. The reason why we can't have both, the reason why we can't have a catalytic converter with a particulate filter and also capture that wasted heat out the exhaust is because the catalytic converter and the particulate filter uses that heat in the exhaust. So that heat, that 30% of energy in the fuel that gets wasted as heat out the exhaust isn't all truly wasted because some of it goes into powering the exhaust treatment systems, the catalytic converter and the particulate filter to clean up the emissions. How much heat is left after that? Well, I don't really know and I don't know if it's worth trying to capture that, but no one's done it yet. Either way, any kind of system would be complicated and add expense to the vehicle. I'm not sure if I want to include this bit in the video because it's not really to do with cars, but it is relevant, but it is a bit geeky, so I'll just keep it really short. In April 2005, I started working in the heating industry. And from memory, that was the same month and year that condensing boilers became compulsory. And what condensing boilers do is they capture heat out of their exhaust and put it back into the boiler. It's quite simple because with a boiler, you want heat. So if heat is being wasted out of the exhaust, you can put water around that heat, heat that water up and capture that heat and put it back into the heating system. With a car, it's far more complicated because you don't actually want heat. You want kinetic energy. Therefore, you need to capture the heat being wasted out of the exhaust, then convert it into kinetic energy to propel the car, which requires a complicated system, which is probably why nobody, or at least I don't know anyone who has done that yet. I'll leave a link to a video up there on different methods to de-ice your car. Which method suits you? Well, that's up to you. But I don't recommend having the engine running whilst you are outside de-icing the car because as explained in this video, you're going to be breathing in harmful gases. I also don't recommend having people in the car whilst you are outside de-icing the car because their breath is going to steam up the windows rapidly, encouraging you to turn the engine on and turn the demisters on. They can wait outside with you until you have de-iced the car, or they can help you de-ice the car. I especially don't recommend having children inside the car with the engine running and the demisters on, because if the wind is blowing the exhaust fumes to the front of the car, the heater fan is going to blow those fumes into the cabin, creating a cabin filled with harmful gases. A child breathes more air relative to their body size than an adult, meaning, in the same environment, a child is going to get a higher dose of the harmful gases than the adult. And their bodies aren't fully developed, meaning they are less likely going to be able to deal with these harmful gases as well as an adult can. My recommendation is to de-ice the car, get in, start it and go. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're looking for car insurance, check out the links to Collingwood and Confused in the description. If you are learning to drive and want to insure yourself on somebody else's car, then Collingwood are there for you because you can do so without affecting the owner's policy. And that takes away a big stress from the owner of that car that you're using to practice your driving in. Via the link at the moment, there's up to 35% off and a 20 pound gift card. If you want to insure your own car, I recommend checking out the link to confuse.com because you fill out one quote form and get loads of quotes back from many insurers to compare who's cheapest. And you can change your car on that quote as many times as you like to compare how much it costs to insure different cars. That's useful if you're shopping around and trying to decide which car you want. Using the links doesn't cost you anything, but it does support the channel. So thank you very much. Subscribe to get my future videos. And until the next one, cheerio.